You know the vibes. Welcome back to a very special episode of the Hoop Genius Podcast. It's myself. See, this show is brought to you by NBA 2K24 as always. And alongside me, as always, three-time NBA champion PJ Armstrong. But we had to draft in a family member here on the show because the team that he helped build, the team that he's the architect of, just advanced in the playoffs. Former general manager of the New York Knicks, Mr. Scott Perry. Welcome back. It's been a while. It's been a while, but it's great to be back right in the midst of this playoff basketball. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> man, my energy's on 10 after that. That was a that was a tense finish over in New York, and we're going to get your thoughts and, and opinions on that. But first, we've got to start over with the Milwaukee Bucks being eliminated by the Indiana Pacers in six games. They lost tonight, 120-98. to Damian Lillard did play. Giannis was not there, but they uh, they were simply outworked by the Indiana Pacers, especially on the defensive end. The Pacers had six players in double fig double figures. They were pressing high up the court. They had the intensity. They were throwing bodies at Dame. Dame still managed to pull up with 28 points, but uh, the Pacers walked away victorious. BJ, what were your thoughts on this game? I know you said you were going to boycott it, but I know you watched it anyway. I peeked at it. <laughs> no. For the Indiana Pacers' sake, I'm I'm happy that they showed up. Okay, uh, you know they got great contribution, and and we always talk about contributions. I mean, they got not one guy, but they got two guys that had 20 points off their bench. They played well. This is a game, a series they should have won because of injuries. I thought they were the better team once all of the guys, Giannis in particular, didn't play, and you know probably took a, an extra game or two for them to finish this finish this out, but they did it. So congrats to the Pacers. And now let's get to the, to the next round. But I, I didn't expect much more than what happened. I mean, this was a big, big time win. So much to overcome a lot of adversity there in Milwaukee. It's going to be fascinating to watch their off season moves. Right? And uh, I think, yeah, I think they're going to, they got a lot of, they got a lot of things to do up there, uh, up there in Milwaukee. We'll get to that. But first on the game, you know, the Pacers started this game with more fast break points in the first quarter than they had in the entirety of game five. And obviously that was a real wake up call for them because they should have closed out the series. Scott, what did you see on the court before we dive into their future moves? Guys, you've heard me say this many a times when I talk about the importance of having depth on your team and the depth wanted tonight. When you, when you can score 48 bench points, being the Indiana Pacers scoring 48 and your opponent only has 10. I mean, do the math. That sets up a, a blowout win for that team and your starters play anywhere near even. Uh, you're running away with the victory. It is so important. And BJ knows this. When you get into a seven-game series, of course you need your, your high-end or star players to play at, at a consistent level. But there are always a game or two where you need someone or – a few people off your bench to have big nights. And that's what we saw tonight with the, this Pacer team, man. You know, so proud of watching Obi Toppin out there, you know, former draft pick. He played terrific tonight uh, with 21. TJ he was McConnell a difference maker. 20. The energy that he brought in off oh. the bench was a difference, man. He really moved the needle for them. It, it, it was huge. And so between the bench play, and I'll tell you what else I, I, I watched with this Milwaukee team. Now, obviously, they're, they're down Giannis, so – you know, that was a huge detriment uh, for them the entire series. Dame in and out. Okay, they're shorthanded. We get it. But you look at that team, they looked a little slow to me, looked a little mm -hmm. older. They looked less athletic, especially without the presence of Giannis. So they didn't have, again, we talk about the depth, you know, a player or players who could at least energize the team. They might not be able to make up for the skill and the impact of Giannis, but again, a play, a couple of players who are athletic enough to keep up with Obi and, and that bench brigade, brigade uh, did not see that from uh, Milwaukee. So they didn't have a chance. You know, when you come home like that in your young team, Indiana, they knew they had to close it out. They didn't want to go back on the road and take a chance going back into Milwaukee. So, Congrats to them. Uh, Well-deserved. And now they're on to the next round against those New York Knicks. So here's, here's my thing with the Bucs, right? Giannis, just three years ago, age 26, 
we're having the conversations. Is he going to get into the top 10 of all time? Could he get to top five all time? He's already got a couple MVPs, defense player of the year. Then he won a championship a finals MVP with one of the best closeout performances we've seen. But fast forward to now, he's turning 30 in December of this year. This year, he missed the entirety of the playoffs. Last year, he missed the two games with his back problems and they lost in the first round to the Miami Heat. The year before, Chris Middleton missed, what, 10 games with his MCL. They lost in the playoffs. So ever since they won that championship, the Bucs have never really had a healthy playoff run. And now with their roster, Brooke Lopez, Bobby Portis, Bobby Portis, um, Chris Middleton, Damian Lillard, these are all older players now. Giannis obviously signed the extension, but... If they can't get it together in next year's playoffs, do you think that he's going to assess his options and think, I've turned 30 years old now. I want to win more in my career. There's the kid in San Antonio who's going to come and compete every year. There's all these other young talents around the league. I need to relocate to a different team. Well, first of all, I don't know Giannis personally to know how he's wired, if he wants to be one of those guys, regardless of what's going on in Milwaukee. Does he want to stay there his entire career because that means something to a handful of players you know to be able to be drafted in a place build it up become a champion there and play your entire career uh, career there so I don't know how much that matters to him but for the sake of the conversation um, and where the game is at today we know a lot of players are open to moving and changing teams uh, what I would say if he wants to move uh I would try my best to stay in the Eastern Conference and not jump over there in the Western Conference. You just mentioned Victor Wembanyama, and they're top heavy with really good young teams in OKC, Minnesota, Dallas. Um, so, you, so you're going to really go through a gauntlet there trying to get out of there to get to the finals. So um, be interesting to watch and, and to see. But right now, I my guess is Giannis has got to be focused on how do we get this team better. I just think, and I mentioned it earlier, They've got to find some kind of way either to develop one of those younger guys on their roster that they didn't play that much this year or go out and acquire one via trade or, or free agency this summer uh, to help energize that group, to help them get through the regular season and, and allow that playoff experience to uh, and, and the older guys come playoff time, be ready to help them win a number of playoff series. Well, here's the thing. They're one of the highest paying in terms of payroll teams in the NBA. And trading away some of their guys, there's not a lot of guys you look at on the roster that you're going to receive in return value, a top level talent. And that's going to make all the difference. And if you do trade, for example, Chris Middleton, then you're giving up your third option. What are you going to get back? That's better than Chris Middleton. They don't really have the leverage in these trade talks. BJ, do you see there's any way that they can improve this roster aside from developing one of the younger players who didn't get a lot of run? Well, I think the main, the main focus for this team at this at this stage, is they've, they've got to find a way to get young legs, new energy into the building, but still maintain their core players, right? And their three core players would be Middleton, Giannis, and Damian Lillard. And they're going to have to figure out how to infuse, you know, their athleticism, like Scott uh, mentioned earlier. But more importantly, they're going to have to get contributions for guys that's going to allow them to play a different brand of basketball. Without question, you have to have players that can play downhill. You're going to have to have people that can guard the perimeter players. And they're going to have to figure out how to address their primary problem, which has been a problem for them since day one, which is how to guard perimeter guards, in particular at the lead guard position. So there are a lot of things to address. You know, you can point to all of the adversity. It's, it's well documented. They've changed coaches. They've done a lot of things. Um, and it's not to make any excuses for them, but it's very difficult what Doc Rivers did this year coming in. So they have a lot of things to address as far as their personnel, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. But more importantly, uh, without question, if there's anything, I think they're going to have to huddle up on as an organization to figure out how to get younger players and play with a little bit more speed and quickness that's required to play in today's game, especially during the regular season. I know Adrian Griffin must be somewhere smiling. He's got a guaranteed, what, four million a year up until 2027, <laughs> being paid out by the Milwaukee Bucks. And, you know, the team had a significantly better record when he was the coach than with Doc Rivers. And obviously it's tough coming in mid-season as a coach. It's going to be good for them to get an off-season together, get training camp together and have a real run at it next year. And hopefully they can all stay healthy. But fellas, speaking of young legs, 
you got to have some young legs to play for this Knicks team because it was another game that went down to the wire. The starters playing huge minutes. Dante DiVincenzo played 48 minutes tonight. And the New York Knicks defeat the Philadelphia 76ers in six games. Final score, 118 to 115. And what a game it was. You know, after what happened in the previous matchup, you just, no lead was safe, right? There was no lead that was safe. And BJ, you and I talked about being up three and choosing to intentionally foul the opposition to send them to the line. Mm -hmm. Tom Tudor must have heard the podcast because that's exactly what he did tonight down the stretch. And they closed out the game. Jalen Brunson with another 40 one point game he's been absolutely on fire this offseason and Bede had 39 and 13 boards but that wasn't enough Scott let me get your take on this Knicks team and how they performed in this first round series Mo BJ everybody's going to be talking about Jalen Brunson coming to ball again another 40 point effort you know Knicks history and look rightfully so he, he has played terrific they're not even in this position uh, to win this series without his play throughout the entire year, let alone uh, this series. But i got to give credit to a couple of unsung heroes in this game that I don't think they win this game or series without. Let me start with Josh Hart. They don't win games one and two without Josh Hart. The they don't win tonight's game without Josh Hart. And, 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 I was, and I was getting there. They don't win one and two, and then tonight he hits the big three. All of the extra possessions that Josh Hart gets this team is unbelievable and it's demoralizing uh, for the defense and in particular the Philadelphia 76ers. I thought he was the key to victory again tonight, just his effort, his hustle, and his willingness to step up because it was obviously Philadelphia's game plan was to let him have those three point shots. They were, they would try, they were shading um, <clears throat> DiVincenzo. They wanted to give him open looks, they wanted to close o OG Ananobi more. And obviously, you know, God Brunson. So they wanted to leave him open. And boy, did he make them pay. Uh, the other guys on the bench, you know, DiVincenzo has a big night. And I thought OG was, was huge tonight, too, at both ends. I mean, he had big-time blocks, big-time finishes at the rim. Oh, that the, 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 was the, the, crazy. crazy. Yeah. And so the Knicks just showed me this. What I, and I said this early on in the series, that – Who's going to get to the most 50-50 balls and who's going to win that battle on the offensive glass? The Knicks won that battle again tonight. That's why they're victorious. That's why they won 4-2. Congrats to them and on to the uh, on to the Pacers. Yep. Josh Hart, 22 offensive rebounds in this series. He had six of them tonight. Isaiah Hartenstein, another player who's made a huge impact. I thought Mitch Robinson did a great job in the minutes where he was out there guarding Embiid as well. And uh, BJ, what are your thoughts on this win for the Knicks? Well, as far as entertainment, this was great. This is great theater. Best series of the first round. Yeah, it, it, no it, question. Was, it, it was very competitive. And it was, I mean, it was very highly contested in in almost every game. Well, every, every game. I mean, it was just down to the wire. This game could have yeah. went either way. What? Yeah. Again, we thought the Knicks had it in hand with about a 50-something seconds to go. They're up six or eight. And somehow the... The, the, the Sixers come back and, and tie the game up. So this was a great series. I loved it. I thought, you know, the coaches did a terrific job. And it, it was one thing that kind of stood out to me tonight was here is a big game, game six for both teams. And suddenly Buddy Hill just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, but to his credit, guys, he was ready when his number was called. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this was, you know, I, 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 you, you got to give Brunson credit. I mean, he, when you say carry the book bag, he, he carried this team. They got great contributions from their, from the others, their players. And those guys stepped up in, in a timely fashion. You know, Josh Hart, that was just a big shot. The offensive rebounding in this series favored the Knicks. And to me, that was the key to the series. I mean, they came up with timely offensive rebounds time and time again, especially down the stretch, when we know the importance of limiting a team to just one shot when you need that defensive stop. So give the Knicks credit. Those guys played a lot of minutes. I think they only played like seven games, seven players again tonight. Yeah. Um, but I'm picking them to win the next series. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I'm, BJ, I'm, I'm picking I, them to win. You, you know, and my, one thing I'll add, you brought up Buddy Hill. And if you're a Sixers fan, and you know how fans will do, 
post-series analyze what happened, they're saying, well, why didn't this guy play the, the, the two games prior to this? Right. Well, this guy is a big-time shooter, shows up in big-time moments, and I wondered where he was. And it was, I was glad. It, he showed you what he was made of. Well, game one uh, and two, he was zero from three. Um, yeah, but, but how many minutes? 26 from minutes you know? across the two yeah. games. Yeah, yeah, right. So he didn't, but again, how much was run for him? But a guy like this who has experience and who's played, and you wouldn't got him at the trade deadline, uh, in my opinion, uh, yeah. I would think that you would have tried him every night and just to see if you get what you got tonight from him. He's one of those players where he just needs one shot to get him going. And you saw Absolutely. that tonight because Absolutely. they were doubling hard on Embiid. They were packing players in the paint to get Maxi to not get to the basket. And he was open and he was the beneficiary of that. And that was the whole plan when they traded for him. And it's ironic, you know, everyone was talking about all series long up until tonight. Has any player lost themselves more money in the playoffs than Buddy Heald, who's entering free agency? And then after tonight's game, it's like, has one game ever made a player so much money in the playoffs? Because he showed <laughs> what he can do when he gets an extended run here. Mm -hmm. um, BJ, I want to ask you this, though, because you played in the NBA as a smaller guard. Now, Josh Hart, a little bit taller than you, but just how impressive is it that someone of his size is getting all of those rebounds? Because we've never seen a player at his height getting all of those boards, especially on the offensive end. Well, it's one thing, you know, I, I think we like to say in scouting is you can't measure a man's what's in his mind and you can't measure what's in his heart. This man, Josh Hart, plays the game the right way. He's tough. He battles and he fights. You know, he he he's going to battle for every possession. So, you know, that just speaks about him. And 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 I think when you watch him play, you you, you tend to watch guys, that, you know, well, he's long. He has a seven two wingspan and all these things. And I'll never forget. There was a player once when I was working for the Bulls. Uh, I don't know if you remember him, Scott Darnell Harvey. Remember Darnell Harvey? Oh yeah, absolutely. Played at Harvard, University of Florida. Well, played at played, University played of Florida. Florida. Florida, exactly. Remember and that? I remember, you know, like so many teams still do to this day. You know, you measure their vertical, you measure their wingspan, yeah. you measure all of these analytics. Their, he, their, he their, could their shoot, second he jump, could shoot, yeah, third jump. Shoot and I remember, <laughs> yeah, I remember him doing this workout. He said, I'm not going to jump the highest. I'm not going to have the longest wingspan. But if it's a loose ball, I bet you I get it. And I never forgot <laughs> <got> that. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's Josh awesome. Hart has figured that out. He, he, he don't jump the highest. He's not the tallest. Mm -mm. You know, but if it's a loose ball, he's going to get it. And so that's the one thing we can't measure. You he he just wants it. He just wants it more. And he goes and gets it mm -hmm. and he fights regardless of whatever the obstacle obstacle is or what's in front of him. So you had to give him credit. So you're going to have to meet meet that intensity with the same level of intensity if you're going to play, if, um, you know, you play against a player like a Josh Hart. Now, the Philadelphia 76ers, obviously, we have to give credit to Joel Embiid for playing this series because he was dealing with a whole heap of injuries. He went out there. A lot of players wouldn't have played those games. So credit to him. But where do they go from here? Another disappointing playoff exit. And it feels like every year we have the same story of Embiid not being fully 100% and ready for the playoffs. And then they get eliminated. So mm -hmm. if they truly want to trust the process and win a championship, where do they go from here, Scott? Well, the good thing for the Sixers, they're going to have some money this summer to go out and spend and to add to that roster. So I think they got to look to free agency to do that um, and see if they can add to Joel. Again, I always believe in developing from within. Tyrese Maxey took another big step this year. I think what he needs to come back next year is just be that much more consistent, especially in tight game situations. You know, sometimes he had, he can go still too fast, and 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 you know, so clean up some of those things and and be able to to change speeds a little bit more and 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 take care of the ball in, in, in crucial situations. So his next step would be crucial for him too. And then Bede's situation is going to be what it is in terms of his body and health. You, you just got to keep your fingers crossed that this guy can uh, stay healthy hmm. uh, enough during the season, and especially the latter part of the season heading into the playoffs and figure out, you know, how you can go about doing that. And, uh, and that's going to be something that he and not only uh, the Sixers team, but I'm sure 
you know, he has his training team available to him as well. That they got to figure that out. Does that mean dropping a little more weight this year? Does that mean getting add a little more flexibility? That's going to be important. But uh, so, but they got to add somebody in free agency that's going to be that consistent third player. You know, they can get them sixteen to eighteen points a night, and also uh, be able to defend us. Uh, you know, play some defense too. So. Um, Kelly well, Oubre, I think, played yep. well enough. He, he for was them solid to, for them, and Buddy Hills on the roster they want to retain. But yeah, the name, I'm sure they try to keep the shooting. The name that keeps coming up for the Sixers this offseason is Paul George. BJ, how would you like that fit of Paul George on this Philadelphia roster? And do you think that's a championship caliber team with Maxi and Embiid? Well, certainly when you look at the talent and you can add a talent like Paul George, you got to take a look now. You know, Paul George over the years has had his, you know, his history with injuries, so forth and so on. And coming into Philadelphia, you know, that's a that's a tough place. So I think that I think their success will revolve around the health of Joel Embiid. Tyrese Maxey has shown that he can carry a team in the playoffs as a one if need be. But he's also he will defer if need be. And he plays with speed and quickness. So I think he's a great fit with Joel Embiid. But they're going to have to address, I think, you know, that wing position, in particular, uh, Tobias Harris. Tobias Harris is, I would free consider agent. him more undersized. He's, an, you know, the free agent, but he's an undersized four. four. Yes. And you're going to have to figure out how to get consistent production from that wing position. Okay. Kelly Uber was nice. Uh, however, you're going to have to find what I would consider an elite 20 game score. Scott said, what, 15, 18 points? 16, 18, need, yeah, but 20. Yeah, yeah but I think 20, yeah. I think you're going to need a 20 game score. And the reason being is because if history is any indication, we don't know what we can get out of Joel Embiid. So you're going to need this guy mm -hmm. to be a 20 point score to be able to maintain and carry that when Joel can't play, maybe for a stretch. But if you can find a player like Paul George with that level of talent that doesn't have to carry a team night in and night out. And those guys are healthy. I think that would be an excellent fit an excellent opportunity, but that's a lot of ifs. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do up front. If they got a Paul George, because you're still going to have to rebound the basketball. You're still going to have to play with some level of physicality outside of Joel Embiid. And so I think there's a lot of things they have to address. And as Scott likes to always refer to, you got to add the depth. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you have Absolutely. two starters like they did tonight in a critical game six and both guys came up with zero points, that's a problem, right? I mean, yep. you can't have two starters. Okay, maybe you can survive with one, but yep. you can't have two starters in a must game like this and, and then expect to be a championship caliber team. And I would add, and you're talking about the depth, and I thought they were going to do this at the deadline. I really thought they needed to add a good backup center with some size. Right. to add. You know, So because in this series – they were afraid to take Embiid off the floor, even one minute. He yeah, was they lost the all the minutes second half. It, yeah, they lost all the minutes by a sizable margin. So if you had a, a big, you know, a, a name that was talked about around the trade deadline was a guy like Andre Drummond, even, mm -hmm. who could rebound, uh, be physical in the painted area, you know, finish on the interior. Uh, they're going to need somebody like that in a backup role. And just, you know, Embiid's not going to play a full 82-game season no matter how healthy he is so somebody who's going to be able to play when called upon um a lot of minutes and you know not uh he won't be Joel Embiid but he, he also will be up to least uh keep the team playing at least at an even level instead of falling off the cliff like they did in the series when he was off the court yeah Sixers fans are big on Paul Reed but I don't know if that's the answer there Scott no. I want to get your opinion on this if I'm the Philadelphia 76ers GM and uh, I can't get Paul George because I think the Clippers will have to keep him after yes. they maybe lose to the Mavericks. But we'll talk about that in a sec. I would go after the man who just dunked on my franchise player and eliminated us from the playoffs. I'm going after OG Ananobi, who's also a free agent this summer. He came up with 19 points, nine rebounds, two steals and two blocks tonight. He provides you with that third option that you can have on the offense. He doesn't need a lot of the ball. He's one of the best defenders in the entire NBA. He brings the toughness and physicality required to compete in the NBA playoffs. You say you need a 20 points per game scorer. I think his career high is around 17. He had a couple of seasons ago, he had 16 and a bit in, in Toronto. 
What do you think about that if you're the Philadelphia well, 76ers? Yeah. Well, as you know, I initially said someone who would average 16 to 18 mm -hmm. points, mm -hmm. he falls right into that wheelhouse, and he gives you the two-way play like you're talking about that, and I had talked about. Uh, do I think he would be an excellent fit there? Absolutely. Do I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Knicks to find a way to keep him? That, yes to that as well, too. So that'll be interesting to see um, where he comes in on the market because he has performed. I mean, his the Knicks with him on the court, I mean, how many games have they lost this year in the regular season? Barely I think they any. Lost three. I think yeah. they only lost three in the regular they've, season. They've lost five games with him on the court. Yeah, yeah right. Since, the, so, since before yeah, the trade deadline. Trade that, yeah, and then, you know, they win this series, this opening series, and he's been huge. Uh, he's answered the call at both ends of the floor, goes about his business. Uh, do I think he could really help them? Yes. He's not that 20-point-a-game score that BJ talked about uh, consistently. But, boy, I do think he could give you that consistent 16 to 18 points. And defensively, boy, it, now he really helps a guy like Joel Embiid, you know, especially with him playing hobbled like he was today because he can control his – contain his man – and uh, and he can protect the rim a little bit as a small forward, you know, undersized four. And we, so. we even saw him guarding Embiid for stretches in this series, and he did a great job yes. of that. But yes. let's look ahead to tonight's games. Mm -hmm. The Cleveland Cavaliers have the chance to close out the series on the road in Orlando for game six. They've been horrible when playing in Orlando so far in this playoffs. Do they fight their demons tonight and seal the series? Or will we be seeing a game seven between the four and the five seeds in the Eastern Conference? BJ, who you got? I got the magic. I mm -hmm. got the magic in this game. I, I I don't know what's going on down there in Cleveland. Something doesn't look right to me where, you know, they've had a three-game stretch. Now, I don't know they won their last game, what is about one point. It's a very mm -hmm. close game. So I'm going to go with the magic back at home. And then, you know, we'll see based on how they win. Now, if they win big, like they won the, the you know, game three and game four in Orlando. And it's really tough to win game seven especially when you're in the visiting team's court. I think they I think they have a chance though. I think that last game gave them the confidence that needs that they will believe that they can win. Now, it's one thing that I saw with and the reason I'm saying that is because you know, I was at game 1 for the Clippers. And to watch game 5 and I, it'd be interesting to see what Scott said, you know, what what his take is when I say this. When a team starts playing to win, that's a whole lot different than just showing up and playing, playing the game. Oh, yeah. The Dallas Mavericks were in game five, they played to win. Now, now, now we got a problem. And so I think the Orlando Magic right now believe that they can win. Even though they lost a game with game five. Oh, no, no yeah, question. I think they, they lost on the final possession. Yeah, I think they're I think now they're like, if we can get back here. We can win this game. So I'm going to pick the Orlando Magic in game six. And, and game seven. Game seven, we'll see. But I got Play to see the song. it first. Play the song. Yeah, Scott, play it, you but, go. I, 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 no, I'm riding with BJ. It's this next game that Orlando, I think, is going to win this at home. I, uh, I feel strongly that they're going to win this at home. Because games three and four at home gave them the confidence that they could beat this team. <laughs> there was this a lot because games one and two on the road. I re, I never forget Paulo uh, Banchero said before the game, "This is new for us. We're a young team, new for me." He admitted he was a little nervous, and he had 15 turnovers in those first two games in Cleveland. Got back home, went on the tack, settled in, and they figured out, "Oh, okay, yeah, this is playoff basketball and in intensity, but." We can play this game and we can beat this team. I think this team is deeper. The the Magic team is deeper. Uh, and I believe top to bottom, they can play more physical. And that's been the problem for the Cavaliers. That was a team that we knocked out last year in New York in large part to physicality, especially on, in the front court where Mitchell Robinson was so dominant last year. Uh, I I believe that this Magic team feels like they should have won Game Five here in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and 
they're going to go back home really ready to play. And Cleveland had, didn't even show up to me in Orlando. It'll be interesting just to watch how they play too because before I pick who would win game seven, I got to see how Cleveland's going to compete on the road. Right. If, they go down there, if they go down there and get blown out again, that's problematic for them. And I think all the pressure I mean, is on Donovan Mitchell as well because you oh, know, he wants yeah, to be a, a superstar in this league and you're playing against an Orlando Magic team that before the season, no one expected them to be here. No one expects them to be the fifth seed. So all the pressure in the world is on him if he can close out this series or not, especially, you know, he, he wants to be the franchise player, whether it be in Cleveland or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That's a tough task now. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's an extremely tough task. So we, he's got a lot to prove. And I know he's thinking about that or he thought about that on that flight down there mm -hmm. and as they're getting ready mm -hmm. to play tonight. So, well, the big one, the Clippers the Mavs. At the start of all of this, I think I said Mavs in seven. But looking at the last game, I'm thinking Mavs in six because the Clippers, to me, if Paul George and James Harden show up like they did in game five, oh, it's going to be horrible because we know what Luka does in closeout games. You can go and ask Devin Booker. Mm. Who you guys got, <laughs> BJ? Who you rocking with for this one? I, you, 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 I'm going with Dallas. D Dallas is playing to win. I, I have nothing to say about Dallas other than let's start the game. The Clippers are going to have to bring a, a different level of the way they think about the game. They can't just play well. They're going to have to play as a unit. They're going to have to play defense. They're going to have to play, I, to me, a mistake-free game where James Harden is going to have to have one of those games that we saw. Was that game four game. that he played exceptionally well? Yep, was that, yeah, but was the game floated four? down the stretch. But that was yeah, just a horrible be. defensive plan from Jason Kidd where they were basically well, feeding yeah, him well, into the lane to well, try Jason and get Kidd's him not, to the rim protector. Jason and Kidd's not playing he's anymore. Got a well, Jason Kidd's not playing. He's coaching. So I'm sure he had a game plan and it wasn't executed. Right now, he has this <laughs> team playing exceptionally well and they're playing together. Those young guys at the center position, Mo, I mean, do we dare say that's that's a nice two-headed monster right now. Yeah, if you think of all the playing, teams right? in the league, yes. who has the better backup, like as a combination of their starting big and their backup big? Because this is what uh, we just talked about with the Sixers. What? Who's backing up Embiid? With the yeah. Nuggets, who's backing up Jokic in those minutes he's not there? The, the Knicks have an excellent one-two punch. You know, Mitchell Robinson yep. was yep. the yep. starter. And, and the Celtics. And, and then Harden saying, you know, and then obviously the Celtics um, with uh, Porzingis and... Uh, I think oh, the Magic have a good, you know, Wendell Carter and Jonathan Isaac. They give you solid production. Little, I think the Mavs, yeah, they're not, Mavs they're are not a bit your, better than that. They're not your traditional centers, those guys, a uh, little more undersized. But uh, to your point, though, they, the Magic do have good depth, though, up front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Scott, what are your keys in this uh, Clippers-Dallas game? No. The Dallas Mavericks know they have to win this game six. You don't want to take a chance having to fly back to L.A., to play a game seven. Not that they're not capable of going there and winning, but they know they have to close this series out. Can't give this team any more life. Luca, Kyrie, you know, Ky they both been in this position. Kyrie has been in this position even more on his way to a championship when he was in Cleveland. So I expect him to come out and play real well. i tell you what has quietly impressed me with the uh, – with the Mavs late in the, in the season and in this first playoff se uh, series, they've gotten a little better defensively. Mm. They, Big you know, time. We talked to, yeah, BJ mentioned the, the two-headed monster um, at the center position where one of them was Daniel Gafford who came over to trade deadline. P.J. Washington, we not haven't talked about him. Been very good defensively. And unsung and, hero, and, and, Derek Jones Jr. Yes, yes. And dare I say, Dare I say, <laughs> say it, Scott. Games say in this it. Couple, couple games in this series now. Luka Doncic discovering that end of the floor. Mm -hmm. And if he will defend remotely like he's done a couple of these games in this series, now you're talking about a whole nother, nother level player and the Mavericks really having a chance to go deep in the playoffs. Because when your best player commits defensively. He doesn't have to be the best defensive stopper on the floor, but just good enough 
to contribute to the effort of the team, keep the, uh, the, the integrity of the team defense sound, which he's been doing for a lot of this series. Credit to him. I expect him to defend a little bit better uh, again in game six, and that's why they're going to close it out. Not because of Luka just scoring 35 points and getting 15 assists, but because he's going to give us some defense. Mm, how about, how about that? <laughs> I never thought I'd see I that. That's I a hot say, take. Yeah. <laughs> that is a hot take. Exactly. But I, I, wanna, I, 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 wanna, I wanna give a shout out because you know he's taking a lot of pressure for not what he's done on the court. Because when he plays, he's unbelievable. We're talking about Kyrie Irving. But he's taking mm-hmm. a lot of he's taking a lot of criticism off the court. Okay. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Kyrie has been the best player in this series. Yes. Yeah. He's been on both teams. Even when his shots player. not falling, he's still been the most and, 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 and I want and I want and and Scott, you know, mentioned it. You know, Kyrie's been in big moments. And there's one thing I can still remember Scott and I talking about Kyrie at, at McDonald's, at the McDonald's game. Yes. Yes. And so he said, say, at McDonald's. <laughs> no, he was, at, he was at the McDonald's All-American game in high school. Yes. And I remember, you know, Scott casually said to me, he said, BJ, Kyrie's that type of guard that you like. I remember him saying that to <laughs> me. <laughs> I said, really? I said, he's, he's small. He exactly. said, no, he's that type of guard that you like. And Kyrie Irving has been terrific in this series. Kyrie had a he's playing at a level on the defensive end. I haven't seen him do yeah, in quite some time. He's as well, too. Yes. No and his leadership defending. has been on point. With this no team. question, no question. He's, so I want to give Kyrie credit because when he plays, I mean, he is a, you know, he's a terrific talent. And Scott, once again, when it comes to evaluating players, he was dead on. He said he's the type of guard that you like. Yes. And Kyrie, <laughs> he, and I remember that. And, and I, Scott I, can verify. He's right here. He, yeah. I remember he called me. He yeah, called yeah, me from yeah. the event and told me yes. that. He said, yes. <laughs> hey, I, and I don't know if you remember I added. He was the best guard that I had seen since a guard who wore number 11 for our Detroit Pistons yes, in yes, terms yes, of handling yes. that basketball. Well, I didn't want to let too much out. I, yeah, that, that was one Isaiah Thomas. So yes. I, he, 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 just, he, he was a special young talent. You could see it. He just had such right. a command on the floor with the way he could handle the ball. And you, you know what we haven't talked about, too? What's incredible? He's not the most athletic guy. He's quick and he's very, he's got great dexterity, but in terms of that high riser, that's not necessarily him, but the way he can finish in the lane over seven footers, contort his body. His hang time, yeah. His hang time, right, left hand. It's as good as I've seen for for a guy, you know, guard that's six, two or none. I agree. I agree. I mean, I agree. So I just want to give him credit where credit is due. Look, Luca is Luca. Yes. But the best player in this series has been Good Kyrie Irving. Good call. He's been the best. Mm-hmm. He's, so mm-hmm. I expect him to win, and uh, I think we'd Good all call. agree. And this, hey, and if they do advance tomorrow, that next round is going to be a monster. We we mm. might need to get it. We might need to get a play by play for one of them games because oh. that's going to be that's going to be a monster. Oh, oh they they. They're gonna, the they're gonna see the Ant Man. Right? No, they're gonna yeah. see Ant Man, right? No, they're gonna see Shay. They're gonna see Shay. They're gonna see Shay. I said, mean, okay, see yeah, the yeah. Joker. Okay, I'm sorry. That's a whole other conversation. Shay. But yeah. they, oh, they're gonna let's, see let's, Shay. Let's, oh, let's end with let's this. Um, okay, Jalen Brunson scored at least 37 points in four consecutive playoff games. Mm-hmm. The first player to do that since Michael Jordan in 1993. So I got to get your predictions for so this. I was series. there for that. I was there. I saw yeah, that. I didn't remember that. <laughs> I didn't remember that. <laughs> At least thirty-seven in four straight games. Yeah, BJ, you were there. You were witnessing it live in the flesh, and I, mm-hmm. no doubt you assisted some of those uh, thirty-seven plus points. Well, I want to know why he didn't pass the ball. I'm sure he was getting double teamed. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, no doubt you would have been better than um, Tobias Harris, right? Then, so, uh, uh, but. <laughs> but I got to get your predictions for uh, the Indiana Pacers and the New York Knicks series. Scott, let's start with you. I'm a favor of the Knicks. I'm picking the Knicks in this series. Uh, they're better defensively. They're physically tougher. Um, Indiana's a younger team. They're really reliant on playing at a real fast pace. 
getting easy baskets in transition. I think the Knicks will limit those opportunities. More of the games will be played to the pace of the Knicks liking than uh, the Pacers, in my opinion. So I'm going to pick the Knicks. I think the, the Pacers will get a game or two, but I think the Knicks uh, win this series in six. BJ? I, I just think this there's too many things when you come to playoff basketball that you, you know, you look at in the series and, and it's one, you look at the talent, you know, both teams are incredibly talented, but there's one variable. It's the toughness. Mm -hmm. I think the Knicks are the tougher yeah. team. Yep. I think that's going to be hard to overcome. I think they're going to set the tempo, you know, uh, Brunson. I mean, look, I, I just don't see any answers for Brunson when it comes what the Pacers are going to do. And if the Pacers pay, play at the pace they were playing in, in the previous series, I think this could easily go 4-0. Well, what, what, what concerns me this, I want to get your thoughts on this. The Pacers, they play at an extremely fast pace. We saw them win this series against the Bucks by picking up their guys full court, Damian Lillard especially, taking him out of game by, not taking him out of game, but slowing him down and making him more, more tired. You saw the effect it had on him in the fourth quarter. And the Indiana Pacers are not afraid to go deep into their bench and have guys out there. Whereas the Knicks are the opposite. Tom Thibodeau will go with his starters <laughs> for as many minutes as humanly possible. My concern is, if I'm the Knicks, is that's a lot of pressure to maintain over a seven game series on legs that are already tied from six games with half your team playing 45 plus minutes a night, basically. How, how do you see that going for nothing? Do you not see that the Pacers could find a way, I'm not saying they'll win the series because I'm picking the Knicks to win it, but they could find a way to wear down Jalen Brunson and the New York Knicks just by throwing bodies at him and wearing him out by giving him all that pressure, extending it 94 feet. That's a strategy to pick him up and utilize more bodies and uh, have a guard in front of him, you know, 70 feet away from the basket and forcing the ball out of his hands, trying to trap him and make others beat you. But when these teams have played before and the Knicks will find a way still, with that being said, to slow it down, even if Brunson has to give it up initially, he'll find a way to get it back and then they'll play half court basketball the way they've been playing all season long with him. He, he's, he's going to score. And the, the guys like Josh Hart and uh, Miles McBride, DiVincenzo, uh, OG Ananobi, Isaiah Hartenstein, all these guys gain a lot of confidence now winning that first round playoff series too. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Sixers and um, Knicks series was a pick em, uh early on, uh, you know, by Vegas, by, by the odds. So th there was there was some uh, pressure now. There's going to be more pressure, though, on the Knicks now. They're going to be heavily favored to win the series. I don't think there's going to be many people picking the Pacers to win. Um, I, to BJ's point, and I talked about physicality. He used the word toughness. And that's what's carried the Knicks all year. I, that's going to carry them again this season. I mean, this series against this team, and, and barring any kind of injury, I just, I, I just don't see uh, the Pacers. Yeah, Knicks Celtics conference them. finals going to go crazy. But the Pacers won the regular season matchup two games to one. Having said that, the most recent matchup on February the tenth, where the Pacers beat the Knicks, Taj Gibson was in the starting lineup for New York at the time. So it's safe to say it's going to be very different this time around. But BJ and I and Scott will be with you every step of the way as we'll be here daily shows every day of the NBA playoffs. So make sure you subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts from. We appreciate all of you who tune in. Scott, we appreciate you stopping by. Don't be a stranger. Stop by again soon. And <laughs> the people have been asking me when they're going to get another watch along. So I think that we've got to run that back as well because... The, the people out there really enjoyed that. So you guys okay. let me know when you're ready because I'm going to be here. All right. Sounds good. Sounds like a winner. Yes, appreciate sir. you, Coach, for stopping appreciate by. Appreciate you. Hey, hey, appreciate you guys for having me. Yeah, I miss yeah, being yeah. here. 
Hey man, and he's like, we here every day. I'm here at five, six a.m. every day. Yeah, exactly. Here. I don't know what time it is for you, Scott, in your part of the world, but we here every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you want to show up, you've got an open invitation to the show. And um, in the meantime, enjoy the orange and blue skies, or as they say. <laughs> exactly. Until next time, yeah. get buckets. <laughs>